Welcome again to Build It With AI. I'm here with Andrew from Last Mile, and today let's learn how Last Mile is enabling developers with generative AI to easy prototype and deliver faster. Stay tuned. Andrew, thank you so much for being with Build It With AI. It's incredible to have you here and with Last Mile. But first, I want to know some things relating to last mile right so what is last mile in the end of the day right because here you're going to create this generative ai platform platform generative ai how those fit yeah yeah really good question and so last mile ai is a generative ai platform for building and testing and deploying generative AI applications um we've gotten a lot of inspiration from traditional ml ops platforms and ml platforms except we've created something customized for generative AI. And so how do we enable developers to build applications that have generative AI capabilities like translation, autocorrect, you know, content generation into their tools as well as their own products. And so, yeah, Last Mile AI is a platform for developers to build generative AI into their apps. I mean, that sounds incredible, but I did not talk. Who are who is you, man? Because of course we talk about last mile, but this is just part of the story. Who is Andrew? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, that's a <laughs> that's a tough question. Uh, who is Andrew? I guess yeah, I am. I used to be a long time uh, product leader, product manager for a while at Airbnb, Microsoft, um, Facebook, most recently. And then I, I recently left to start this uh, journey with coworkers of mine at Facebook AI. And yeah, and I'm, I'm an enthusiast of technologies. Um, I really like embracing new technologies as well as bringing a lot of old ideas and practices into new technologies because oftentimes technology is very circular and there's a lot of learnings that can be reapplied and done in the best way. And so I get to merge both of that for this new company, you know, taking generative AI and then the learnings that we've had with building more traditional systems at these companies and, and bring it together to make a stellar product. That's a good point because here's the thing. What is the difference between, you know, in your point of view, Gen AI, classic AI, because now you're talking about Gen AI, classic AI, etc. But you talk about platforms, right? So what is a, would be a platform for classic AI and what do you think Gen AI needs their own exclusive platform? Yeah, yeah. And so this, this conversation is pretty near and dear to my heart because we've been working on ML platforms, me personally, for... I think over five years um, doing it at Airbnb as well as Facebook. And the key parts of it is the traditional machine learning that um, we've been working on for a while, whereas, you know, ensembles, neural nets, um, and a lot of these systems were designed for ML engineers to, to build different classifiers or predictive models for either a ranking use case, fraud use cases, and we built a lot of technology to enable them. And so that technology was, how do I train my data? And then how do I use that data to evaluate it? And then how do I push it to scale? And then how do I make sure I can do it over again? Um, that was widely you know, the most popular form of ML um, until ChatGPT, I think. Uh, ChatGPT really uh, busted open all the doors and then LLMs became the most popular thing. And generative AI was uniquely different from traditional ML because it was so much more accessible. It was, everybody had it. You didn't need to use your own training data to create a model from scratch. You didn't need to have ML engineering expertise or you know come from academia who's done machine learning. You could have used ChatGPT, GPT-4, the APIs, and you can build something mind blowing. And, and with that, we mix the best practice of the old for machine learning um, into these large language models so that you can feel comfortable doing the same type of things, except, you know, we infuse the best practices into our platform. So you don't even need to learn about, you know, all the ways that evaluation or testing happens. It's very interesting. So you decided to spin up a business with it, right? So what would be, would be the use case? Imagine that I know I'm a client, so how we're going to pitch this. So, hey, you didn't learn anything. You just do it. How do you feel that the engineers will benefit from it on the business narrative sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the way that we, we've seen a lot of our users go about it is 
they have tried out usually GPT-4, 3.5, uh, some of the leading LLMs out there, and they see the power and they see it either for, I want this to generate marketing content for our marketing team. I want this to facilitate sales. I want an internal information repository that people can access and use. Uh, the next question that really comes up from there is, well, how do we build it into our application? And the way that we talk about it is the people that are building these apps for your internal users, for your marketers, for um, your sales team, you can actually empower them with this platform to build the generative AI capabilities in a robust production grade way. And so that's been really resonating where a lot of the people really want to get access and leverage and harness the power of LLMs. And they really need that tooling, that platform that helps them take them into production. I see. I mean, that sounds amazing because now you're going to have an easy way to do it. But one thing that touched, picked my attention was related to, you said that you work for Airbnb, Microsoft, which is your reader right now, <laughs> and they talk, they work with Meta as well. So you have a big tech company, you have a very nice career. So why leave big tech companies to create your own company? What was the big motivation for you to do it? I know you said this, you got with some friends as well. So that's not only you, it's a team leaving those kind of big companies and making, you know, taking a big risk. So how do you feel to do for doing that? And what then why doing that anyway? Yeah, I'm always a little bit conflicted because it's not the traditional startup story. I think the traditional startup story is um, having this inspiration, this, you know, uncontrollable need to do the startup. And so, you know, looking for the first opportunity to really go out and build it. Um, I actually really enjoyed my time at these big companies. Uh, I enjoyed my time at Microsoft uh, in Redmond. I enjoyed my time at Airbnb and SF and then in Facebook. And the biggest nudge for us to build it was we've been working on these systems for so long and the biggest thing in the back of our mind was we've been building all these systems for ml engineers which you know to be quite honest is not that many and this is now an opportunity for the wide broader developer community to get involved and to build applications and so that was a big nudge and then that fire and that urge of like this is a unique time in machine learning was you know there with our co-founders and the founding team and and we were like this is a rare opportunity and so we all at that time the timing was right it seemed like uh everyone was ready for ai and ml and so we were all able to take that leap together and so i i, I genuinely believe you know just starting this journey with them was probably the biggest blessing you know it's it always feels scary to start something by yourself and then it feels a little bit better to have a few people when you have your team with you it's it's quite unbelievable um, it sounds incredible you saying that, but one thing that I, I took note is that you took like a more ownership style. Yeah. Of, no, you're doing a leadership position on there. So how big is your responsibility now day to day compared when you were a manager? Because we, before we talked a little bit and you said you were yeah. a manager. So how does it compare to be leadership position versus being a manager of a startup and how do you feel the complexity um, is different, etc. How can you explain how that? Really good question. Um, I think it has a lot of similarities. There's always stakeholder management of at being at a startup, your stakeholders are now um, investors and other folks who are really invested in the company. And at a larger company, being a middle manager, you have then your managers and then you have the VPs and then you have to manage expectations there. It has similarities, I would say, the biggest difference across both is most likely there really is no kind of role and responsibility at this point. You know, if there is something that is wrong, there is no one else. You know, the buck ends with us and we have to solve it. And so that's quite different. At, at Facebook, there is so many, right? And so oftentimes, if we needed to get data science support, design support, we can facilitate those conversations and, and get teams to come together and work together. Um, in the startup world, you know, some some of the bad things that I've made are still out there. And, you know, there's, <laughs> there, I cannot find, you know, if there is no expert to do it, then, you know, it'll be me. And so, you know, you can oftentimes see if something is something, you know, I designed and it's usually not as 
polished versus you know something that our wonderful you know designers able to do and they'll do so much better but yeah um, are you the only designer on the team yeah yeah we do uh so um i used to be a pm manager and then uh the design manager i used to work with is also on our team and so we've been really lucky with that how many roles do you feel yeah our team size is nine nine and growing yeah and so we're we're active in this kind of general AI space and domain. I mean, uh, not only that, I'm asking uh, what, no, the roles you feel, you feel designer, you feel engineering manager, you, uh, you're filling everything that you can write about right now during the, the company. That's right. Well, it's, um, I think the biggest way that we think about it is we just really have great people who could do a lot of things. They're almost like Swiss army knives where they can, do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so that's been really tremendous where I think at a startup, you just have to be good at multiple things and wear many different hats. And so that's something that we've been really lucky to have. Yeah. I know that because I worked before in a startup and I have to do this admin back end, front end, yeah. do anything in deployment. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. It's you it, have so clear how much a big company has once you don't have it. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you said you were a PM. So how valuable has been your, you know, this PM experience has been for you and yeah. how you feel that the other PMs will deal with being, you know, starting their own startup versus someone that is deeply in tech, for example, a software engineer, etc. That's right. Um, I would say overall, it's been incredibly useful because um, PMs have kind of a variety of skill set. I would even so say so like my time at Azure was extremely val valuable. Um, this was seven years ago, I think I was back at Azure, maybe, yeah. And I was working on a relatively new database called uh, Document DB, and now it's Cosmos DB. And that was tremendous in the learning experience because we really didn't have all everything. We had to kind of grassroots everything. And that oftentimes meant that we were wearing many different hats depending on what would needed to be done. And that was the first time I caught a glimpse of, okay, like we, there are many hats out there and like, you know, I'm struggling with some of it and there's a lot to learn and that really kind of kicked off the spark to learn about how does everything really work and, and building more of a, a rounded skill set. So, and I think PMs generally tend to lean towards it just because their role often requires different things of them depending on where the product's at. Um, but yeah, and so I, I did notice that PMs going into startups generally, they do find alignment. You know, every time you talk to a PM, they're always thinking about doing a startup. So it did, you can see the synergy there. <laughs> Makes total sense. And talking about startups, and how was it to build your the startup? Because great, you got the people, you got everything, but how was to build it actually? And how are you feeling of the current scene now of startups? Do you think that's accelerating, Gen AI hype? And how yeah. are you feeling with all of that? Yeah, okay. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think for building out the Gen AI startup, it's been incredible. Um, I, I cannot say... You cannot really think about how we were able to accomplish so much um, from starting out. I think only because we've been in this space for so long and we've seen the problems that it's been a lot easier. And a lot of the things that we know that people will encounter because the generative AI uh, ecosystem and how things are developing are very similar to machine learning. And so you can actually take a lot of learnings from machine learning and, and put them back into for generative AI and so a lot of the tools, the libraries, and the platform that we've built just takes those best practices. Um, and so looking back to the journey we've come to up until now, I cannot you know, be but extremely proud of how we were able to accomplish so much. But there's so much more to do. Um, and so that's kind of, yeah. And that's the first part of the question. What was the second, third? I mean, uh, to build it, now you folks personally, how was to build it your AI with, you know, a lot of people come, game, that's great, but now we need to build it. So how was actually the building process until now? 
Yeah, um, the building process was that was very similar to I think a, a big tech company where you know we're able to mobilize to organize ourselves. Much less meetings, but you know the coordination is really important. Um, the problem or the meetings, Andrew? Yeah, the meetings. Uh, <laughs> now I have I still have tons of meetings, but it's mostly now with like customers and, and user interactions. Um, but before it was a lot of you know cross collaboration across teams. Now it's much more focused externally. Internally, uh, we use a lot of the tooling there, a lot of Microsoft tooling, you know, with, with GitHub, GitHub issues or issue tracking. Um, we use a lot of GitHub now because we've open sourced a, a pretty big chunk of our platform. And, and so that's been really nice, you know, tapping in more and more to the Microsoft ecosystem. That's a great question that you gave to me. Thank you so much. You have to make the decision to open source. So, yeah. how is your uh, why you made that decision? Because a lot of companies are fearful of not releasing code open source. So, what what made you take take that step? And yeah, how would say to other founders as well too? Hey, you can open source this or that. Yeah, I think open source is a very personal decision for each company. Um, for us, the reason why we've open source was we felt like a lot of the things that we're building is so beneficial that adding any unnecessary hurdles or blockers wasn't doing it justice. It, it was just so beneficial for folks to use that we wanted to make sure that it gets into everyone's hands and they're able to try it. Um, it depends, you know, case by case. Companies are like, well, that's our, you know, our gold mine and we don't want to give it out. I think for us, ML really doesn't exist without open source. Like, uh, you know, we PyTorch from uh, Facebook, TensorFlow from Google. Open source is what really drove machine learning and AI. And it's hard to imagine that it won't play a major role in how it grows. And so um, to us, it's a little bit obvious, yeah, that we have to contribute back to open source. Very interesting that you made that point that you feel that generative AI needs to have a more open source friendly community to grow. So about that, right? So how do you feel will be the future for generative AI and open source? Now you gave that to me. Not a good, I believe, a question. So do you see that you're going to have more companies open sourcing that yeah. or do you feel that we're going to have more drug closed source future with generative AI? Yeah. Um... It's hard to say, but I think, sorry, just spending some time to think about this. I, I think it's mixed. I think one trend is research and innovation as well as progress will be made in the open source. Um, and only through transparency can you actually really build upon. And there's a lot of concerns of if you have all this information public, what if malicious behavior happens? But the counter side of it is Without this public, then you're relying on that specific company to make the right precautions. And that doesn't access the, the world's worth of talent where they can make this much safer and build a better system out there. Um, and then the counterpoint is there are massive investments, you know, like I think OpenAI and other folks are spending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into this. And it is, you know, feels like it feels like it might be the largest donation. <laughs> to the world in, in quite some time. And so, you know, what do you, what, how do you gauge that? And how do you justify putting that as the public? And so I understand both sides. Um, and I think we'll see how it goes. You know, maybe it's kind of a model that's, you know, replicating other structures where research like this happens, where if there's so much R&D, then you have it closed for a year and then you open source it or, you know, something like that. But it's, it's really interesting to see. Yeah, and so we'll see what happens. I mean, that sounds incredible. So let's see the power of the platform, you know. Let's see how can we enable developers of Genetive AI prototype and delivering with less Maya. Do you have anything to show me? Yeah, I have tons to show you. Yeah. Let's um, go. So this is our website here, uh, Last Mile AI. Um, and we have an open source project called the AI Config. Uh, one key thing that we've looked to open source is we've worked a lot on these ML platforms. And a key part is the ML platform for Generative AI is more collaborative than ML. Uh, and so you often find yourself engineers who are building the application, working closely with PMs or different functions to validate prompts, to help tune prompts. 
And so we've decided to make a configuration that can take the generative AI components and make it easily accessible for others to contribute. And this is really nice because then you can version control it and you can have a really safe way to put it into production. Uh, let me show you a quick demo here. Um, this over here is in VS Code. We actually have a published VS Code extension. And this is a really nice UI to edit those AI config files, which are just JSON files. Um, here I can execute it on GPT 3.5. Uh, it's very notebook-like for those who've used Jupyter Notebooks. And I'm just asking it, get me the activities um, or tell me 10 fun attractions to do in New York City. And then from there, I can actually take the results from the first one and I can ask it to chain it into another cell and I can tell it to order by another parameter. And that parameter can be anything else I really decide, um, whether I choose this one, I'm doing it by geographic location and I'm asking it to reorder it for me. And so this is a really friendly UI for um, engineers who want a UI to help develop as well as uh, PMs or other folks. Um, and so let me just rerun this again, GPT-4. Oh, it needs a little bit more information, but it does chain it together. And so you can actually use this JSON object within code, which is really nice because I've just created the generative AI pieces to leverage within my application. And so within code, within our SDK, you can actually install. So this is an IPython notebook. And I can actually just load up that same JSON file and run it. Uh, and this is really cool because I have now a UI based way to modify and create my logic. And then through code, I can actually productionize it. And then I can use that asset and version control it. And it gets even cooler because I'll kind of show at the end as we, as we go through all the steps here, it's running through the same thing, run against open AI. Let's see over here. And right now this is running the order by. So this is slightly different results than GPT-4. Um, and you can see here it's doing each one, it's ordering it by duration. Then we'll let it run GPT-4, it runs a little bit slower than GPT-2.5. And then here we go. And then I can actually add this back into the prompt. And then I'm actually saving this. I can run this new gen packing list, this new prompt that I've added, and then I'll save it. I have a quick question. Get sure. Geo New York was running? Because I remember when I talked about, about it uh, before, uh, we asked our joke, oh, is it raining New York? So let's see. What yeah, can yeah. I do in New York? Why is rain? You, uh, tell me 10 fun attractions you didn't understand when it's, it's raining. And this is now on the fly. I'm changing that exact logic that's being built and running on the SDK. And so, you know, I basically validated, tested without having to write any code and it's modified that underlying logic, which is very cool. So here it's giving you a bunch of things, a lot of indoor things, a lot of museums, you know, there's a Nintendo world store, these type of things. Um, and then you can actually use this so I can go and open this finder and upload it into our platform here. So I can share it more broadly. And so here you can create it from the config and I'll just drop it in. create a workbook. And now I have a hosted managed version of it. Um, and so I can do those same exact things here um, and run that same exact logic, which is very cool. Oh, I forgot to save it, the, the ring. I didn't click control save. Don't worry. <laughs> but yeah. And then uh, we have a way to do evaluation and run it in a batch. And so we're really streamlining and making the experience really simple while building in the best practices behind the scenes so that you're building a production grade application. It's all source controlled. It has the collaboration features built in, ways to do your monitoring and observability. And so those are all baked in as well. I want to ask you where I want to know about the observability of this. It looks interesting. Where can yeah, I take a look at that? The big part of it is um, right over here. We have, when you run all of these, actually a stack tree sets building. Um, so from here, whenever you do the calls, you actually have all these callback handlers for what's being executed, what's the input, what's the output. And then we've worked with a lot of companies that are leading in telemetry and logging um, so that you can actually persist the stack trace of what's happening for debugging purposes. 
And, and a neat integration that we're working on is also doing the evaluation on the fly for these so that if I you know, do the activities here, I can actually do a simple assertion to say, make sure that the end result of the model is always 10 things. I need it to be 10 things and I need to have a validator to make sure that the results are always 10. So we have all the logs over here. Um, I don't think we've saved any logs for this particular application, but yeah. No problem. Um, question, you said about version control. Yes. Some people may, may go and say, why don't you using get? Why, why should I watch when I get or do anything else? So what do you feel that last mile does differently for version control than, you know, GitHub, GitLab, and others? Yeah, yeah. So it actually works in conjunction with it. Um, the big part of it is the data format. And so when you go into, you know, some of our examples, the big part that we do is actually trying to build that overall JSON file or YAML. Mm -hmm. And YAML is particularly great because for really long prompts, you can actually start doing the individual disk line by line for the prompts here. Um, so it's about putting the format together all in one place so that you can have clean version control of just your generative AI pieces, as opposed to when the generative AI logic is mixed within code, you have this larger code files, libraries that you need to figure out what's happening. Here, everything is abstracted out, which means if I were to change this to 20 politicians, you can actually do the diff through Git, GitLabs, anything else to figure it out. And so uh, when we think about version control, we really think about is what's the right format to use your existing version control? Because nobody wants another version control for their company. That's a, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That would be a question. So this looks, you know, amazing. So about it. How do you feel companies you say that, ooh, there is value here? What do you think will be the biggest value holder, a real value for your stakeholders on this product? And I'm going not to ask what you need to improve because they got a number and number of things, but you can yeah. say biggest value for companies and what do you think you're folks, you know, aiming for next versions? Yeah. So the biggest values that come out right now is people who love our product or people who have embraced generative AI and they have XFN and collaborative teams working on it. Uh, when it's an individual, generally, you don't need to abstract things out because you're, you're the only person who's really working with that code. But for the companies that are like, we have teams and we have a lead, we have PMs involved, this has been really great because eventually what they find out is PMs and the leads aren't going to rebuild the app and so what they're looking for is a way to test it without having to rebuild the application. So that's been really shining. Uh, and then the second one that has been really working is we've been doing a lot of evaluation for rag-based systems. And rag-based systems, the biggest one is how do you detect hallucinations? And so we've been working with a lot of companies one by one to really cater and customize evaluation for them using state-of-the-art leading techniques as well as imbuing it with some original techniques that we've seen within ranking and recommendation systems, which have a lot of similarities. And so those have been really shining within our product, the evaluation as well as the collaborative nature of our product. I see. And for this, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about you now companies, etc. So how do you feel that you now founders have helped you, you know, build this company? And because you know you're dead a lot of people, you probably yeah. use some as I said before, Microsoft products, so we want to know. Yeah. How Founders Hub helped you with that? Yeah, so Microsoft, Founders Hub in general has been super helpful because really two things. Uh, one is Microsoft and OpenAI are leaders in this gender BI space. And so uh, being able to access experts as well as being able to leverage uh, the OpenAI technologies has been really useful. Uh, we've opted to go with OpenAI on Azure because there's a lot of uh, guarantees on availability, and we're able to have more predictable behaviors. And this has been important because a lot of our users uh, want predictability. They're building this for production, and predictability is the most important thing, which is like latency, availability, you know, cost, all these type of things. Um, the second thing was access to Microsoft resources for uh, especially enterprises. Uh, we work with a lot of enterprise companies. They are fully built on the Microsoft you know, ecosystem. And so a lot of PowerPoint, a lot of Microsoft Teams, a lot of Word docs. And so that's been really useful for us as well, where you know, being able to 
I mean, almost going back to my roots of the first job I had, you know, leaving, leaving college and then reusing these technologies and then speaking the same language and, and giving the same type of technologies that these enterprises are using has been, has been very useful for us. Yeah. I mean, sounds great. And the mentorship that you got some? <laughs> yeah, it's been useful. I think um, we've gotten some mentorship. I think part of it is also because I've come from the Azure space. Uh, we we're also able to tap into a lot of old coworkers who a lot of them have drifted into the NL side. And so um, they've been really, really good mentors, uh, especially for me, both on the technology as well as just in general and career and, and decision making on how to make the best decisions in the space. Okay, Andrew, now I'm going to have your last question. So sure. I better be free part question. Okay. <laughs> last how three questions. See, <laughs> yeah, last three questions. So how do you see Journey of AI in the future in five years, hmm. Last Mile in five years, and you in five years? Okay. So how do I see Generative AI in the future? Um, so in Generative AI in the future, the big trend, at least, Right now, it's very circular, but right now is more smaller language models. Mm -hmm. um, and people are finding that the large language models are, it's kind of like using a, a power tool for, you know, screwing in the, the screw on your glasses, like there's a small screw for that. And so people are finding that, you know, with more precision, they can actually go with smaller, uh, smaller models that are fine tuned and trained to do certain operations really well. And so we've been helping on that front. Um, we also see multimodality becoming more popular. Um, you know, text has been really popular. Image was popular before that, but it's you know coming up again. Audio, video, video, and combinations of these modalities. And then uh, the last one is I think for generative AI, it's going to be imbued in every application. I think it is so valuable that every application you use in your day-to-day -day has some inherent value for it, whether it's a simple spell check or whether it's a translation to any different you know, language, whether it's a, you know, um, can you actually speak out the words instead of me having to read them, um, like a text to, to audio, I think it'll be imbued everywhere. Um, and then your second question is for Last Mile AI. I think for yeah. in five years, Last Mile AI will be the de facto tools, libraries, and platform for generative AI development, especially for companies and, and application developers. And so we hope to realize that dream in, in five years time and, and help support and bring best practices there. And then last but not least for me, hard to say. I, I mean, like it's, uh, I think when I first interviewed at Microsoft about a decade ago, um, I was asked this question and I would say like, I wanted to be a manager and I wanted to, you know, work on something cool. Um, as I get older, it's getting harder because I feel like the startup moves so fast that it's been harder for me to imagine myself in five years. I'm like, how am I going to be in three months? Like, <laughs> like, like, I can't imagine like a year out how I'll be in that it's become, that's also very circular. I think like when you're just out of college, it's hard to imagine where you'll be in five years and now in a startup space, it's really hard to imagine where I'm going to be in five years. Yeah, I see your point here. And that's the thing about startups. They go fast and you never know anything. But I hope that, you know, that was very helpful for not only you, because now I want to see last mile grow, you know, maybe it will become de facto and this yeah. interview will be shown everywhere. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I hope interview. so. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, with that, uh, let's put the slide. So if you want to join Andrew in Founders Hub, you can do it right here. In Founders Hub, you can enable the founder, you can be enable your company to build more. Know how to infuse Azure OpenAI, as Andrew said, it's gonna be everywhere. So infuse your product with Azure OpenAI. Learn from Azure experts, unblock barriers, and win 150K in Azure credits, GitHub, Microsoft 365, LinkedIn Premium, and more. Scan the QR code and, you know, join Founders Hub. And with that, I finished today's program. Andrew, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have, you know, you and Les Maya with us. Amazing. No, thank you, Pablo.